to begin by reading a poem. I'm not an artistic person, but I have an appreciation for beauty and for beautiful work. The poem is uh, Leap Minnow's Leap, and it's, it's written by a man that I met from Appalachia. His name is James Still. He lived most of his life in Appalachia. He was Kentucky's poet laureate. These pictures are going to scroll through on their own. They're pictures of my home place and you know, our work. They're not synchronized with my talk. Leap Minnow's Leap. The minnows leap in drying pools, an island of water along the creek bed sands. They spring on dying tails, white bellies to the sun, gills spread, gills fevered and gasping. The creek is sun and sand and fish throats rasping. One pool has a peck of minnows. One living pool is knuckle deep with dying, a shrinking yard of glittering bellies. A thousand eyes look, look, a thousand gills strain, strain the water air. There's plenty of water above the dam, locked and deep. Plenty, plenty and held. It is not here. It is not where the minnows spring with littlest fear. They die as men die. Leap, minnows leap. In preparing for the CUSP conference, I came across a quote or a statement in the website describing the conference. The quote says, whatever isn't naturally occurring is likely somehow designed. Well, I'd never been here before. I'd never heard of cuss before. And when I thought about that, I thought, yeah, I'd like to go to a place where people think that and see what it's like to spend a couple days pondering life and the universe and work and relationships from that perspective. And it's been exhilarating. When I look around, I see nature as designed. I see the Appalachia that James still describes in his writing as being designed. Some of you may not have been to Detroit or may not have been there lately, but believe it or not, I, I think Detroit is designed. And that's really hard for me. Detroit's my hometown. I still believe every year the Detroit Lions are going to win the Super Bowl. <laughs> it's hard for me to accept that Detroit is designed when I hear the mayor of the city at the time, it was Dave Bing. He was working on a, a grand redesign of Detroit. He had to make a case for why do we need to redesign Detroit. And he pointed out that 50% of the adult population is chronically unemployed. Detroit's known for its failing schools. We've had battles with other cities around the country every year who actually gets the moniker worse schools. We kind of go back and forth from being the worst to next to the worst or near the worst. We have broken street lights. About half the street lights in the city have worked over the last several decades. High crime rate, murder capital of the world, we've, we've shared that moniker as well. Detroit's population has plummeted from nearly 2 million people in 1950 to just over 600,000 people today. And if you look at a graph, everybody didn't leave after the 67 riots. They started leaving in 1950 at about 1,000 people per month every month since 1950. Steady stream. It's an obscene dysfunction that has at times caused me to cry. There was one day in particular. I was driving into Detroit from Ann Arbor early in the morning. I, I leave early to beat the traffic. So it was dark. It was winter. Street lights were out. And I was singing. I like to sing. I'm not good at it, but I like to sing. And I had the Soweto Gospel Choir on CD playing in my car. And there's this song, very simple. It's Jerusalem, Jerusalem, lift up your voice and sing. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to our King. Celebrates God's kingdom on earth and our being part of it. And when I got to a traffic stop and I'm singing this song, I saw a woman coming out of a side street where there were no street lights, and she's walking her two children <laughs> to the bus stop in the dark. And that was bad. But when I thought about her situation, I pictured her turning around and walking home alone in the dark past abandoned houses, overgrown brush. And it just struck me that we can do better than that if we care. The resiliency of Detroiters and their hopes for better lives, living in better neighborhoods, has inspired me. In 2004, I was 46 years old, so I had 46 years of life experience. 
And I was 24 years into my career in agricultural production and economic development. I don't have time to tell you how I went from a city kid to agriculture and farming, but I, I did it. And I'd been involved in several interesting adventures and challenges. I worked as an agricultural educator through the Mennonite Church in Zaire, which is now the Congo. During a time when I lived in southeastern Kentucky, I helped environmentalists and the coal industry reach a collaborative agreement focused on equipping the regional economy for life after coal mining. That was incredible. I provided consulting services to several hundred agricultural and food system entrepreneurs, people who had dreams, people who'd been laid off in the auto industry and got a severance package. They said, this might be a good thing because now I'll finally pursue the dream that I never had the focus to pursue before. And I helped people start with an idea, build out a business plan, pull together resources, take the risk, and make their mark. It was in 2004 that I developed an interesting dialogue with a man who wanted to start a business in Detroit. I was at a point in my life where I wanted to make a mark on my hometown. When this man called me, he asked for help in relaunching a farmer's market on the corner of Shane Street and Ferry. This market just happens to be in a neighborhood where my great-grandparents settled in the early 1900s. It's a neighborhood that my parents grew up in. And they used to walk to this market with their little red wagon to get produce. I'd heard stories about it. I'd never been there. I didn't know why I'd never been there. But when this man said he wanted to reopen the market at Shane and Ferry, I said, oh, yeah, absolutely. So I drove down to meet him. And what I discovered was why I had never been there. My family doesn't go back there. It, it, at the time, it was one of the most dangerous neighborhoods, I think, in the city. Real problems, drug abuse drug addiction, prostitution, and everything that goes with the drug culture, all the crime that comes along with it. So I met with this man, and we wrote a business plan to relaunch the market. And uh, I'll tell you that the narrative for the business plan and the numbers that we put together were great, really compelling. And it was really easy to get a grant to start a farmer's market in a neighborhood like Shane Street. Everybody wants to see a neighborhood like that, hit the bottom and rebound and, and make a big comeback. Well, to make a long story short, we got a grant, we started the market, and it, it failed. But I didn't want to leave. Now that I had enough courage to go there regularly and kind of think about my connection to this neighborhood, where it's at, and what's possible in the future, I went across the street and I met a pastor who led a church. And we talked about what the neighborhood needs. And he said that the neighborhood needed economic development that's capable of creating jobs for chronically unemployed people. So I suggested that agriculture perhaps is the most forgiving sector in our economy for emerging entrepreneurs, especially in Detroit. There is an abundance of vacant land. And it may not be yours, but you can use it. You can use it for free because there's so much of it and nobody ever really can keep track of what's happening on all this vacant land. So you can just kind of go out there, a pioneer in your homestead and you clear a spot. And Land is free. Seed is free. There are people who give out seeds in urban centers all over the place. So I can get free tomato seeds and free land and there are free tools in everybody's garage. So, so far everything's free. And if I take the seed and I put it in the ground and I grow a tomato plant, it'll produce six pounds or 10 pounds of tomatoes at 60 cents a pound or a dollar a pound. So I go from nothing to $10 every time I put a seed in the ground. If I do it over and over, I can right size the business to my needs. I've told that story to so many emerging entrepreneurs in cities and it's almost like fishing with an illegal lure. It's like I, I catch fish all the time. <laughs> Well, within a year, we had a successful market garden up and running. I need to clarify that it was a successful garden in terms of production. The problem that we faced in our work was that the gardeners were recovering addicts, and when produce was sold, our gardeners took the money from the sale of the produce, they went down the street, they bought drugs, and they were back on the streets. Well, the dynamics of this struggling micro-business were very frustrating. I was torn between my interests in trying to find a way to overcome the barriers 
to success and the cost of continuing to mentor emerging entrepreneurs in this broken neighborhood. So I went for a walk to sort things out. And as I walked, I prayed. And I told God that my work seemed futile. Have you ever talked to God? Most people have. Has he ever talked back to you? Most people say, I'm not sure. It was an unmistakable response that I got from God. He said, Mike, you need to work with people where they're at with what they have. <laughs> I laughed out loud. I was standing next to a large open area covered with weeds. I could see the downtown skyline in the background. I said, God, these people are poor. They have empty land. But when I looked up for the first time in my life, never discussed it with anybody before, I saw that while Detroit has gardens that dot the landscape, Detroit needed a large-scale farm or large-scale farms to eliminate the blight that dominates the city of Detroit. One-third of Detroit's landscape is surplus city-owned property, a 139-square-mile city with 40 miles of surplus publicly-owned land with no purpose and no budget for maintenance. It doesn't get mowed. The trees don't get cut. The garbage doesn't get picked up. It's overwhelming. Publicly owned blight has been strangling Detroit for decades. So this new insight overwhelmed me. It was like I got hit with, with a bolt of lightning. And it just focused me on that idea. I went back to my office, and in the course of my, my next days, people would say, well, what are you working on, Mike? And I'd say, I've got this idea. I have a vision of addressing blight in Detroit neighborhoods by using a large farm as a tool, the farm becoming a platform for economic development, for tourism, for education, and most of all, for reconciliation. If you were going to try to define Detroit, the story would best be told by talking about the fractured relationships. Labor management, rich poor, black white, urban rural, suburban, the whole city has been fractured like a mirror. You just drop it on the floor, it's cracked. But if you start a farm, it seems to be the connecting point that everybody can rally around. You have to get the dialogue going somewhere. The farm provides the platform. Well, I told this to people, and they said, wow, what a great idea. We'd like to work on that with you. So we went, and we formed a team, and we, we wrote a business plan for a large farm in the city of Detroit. It took us more than six months. And when we got to the end of... This plan, we said, it's a beautiful plan, but we don't know anybody who has this much money. The cost of doing this was beyond our reach, beyond our imagination. We didn't know how we'd ever pull it off. So we agreed to put it away. Three months later, we came back. We said, no, it's too good of an idea. Let's try again. So we reworked the plan. We tried to tweak it. We tried to make it feasible, and we came up dry. It was like having a disease that won't go away. My friends all left it. I was stuck. Like, the idea didn't leave me. All my friends have shelved it, but I still have to find a way forward. Well, in 2008, coincidentally, four years later, John Hans was driving from his home in Detroit to his corporate offices in Southfield, Michigan. He's a longtime city resident. He loves the city. He loves its history its architecture, its characters. And John, like many, had noted that the city had been going through this transition. If you're not from Detroit, you'd say it was in the toilet. If you're from Detroit, it's just a transition, because we're optimists. The neighborhoods were, in effect, evaporating. Houses were abandoned and then boarded up and then either burned down or demolished. Once populated streets were covered with unmanaged brush, so while stopped at a light one day, a traffic light, he asked himself, when is someone going to do something about Detroit's downward spiral? And as he thought about it, he realized that maybe if he really wanted to see positive change, the someone needed to be him. Well, John is a very successful businessman. He excels in analysis and resource management. His core business is based on his model of integrated financial services. So when John thought about steps that could be taken to revitalize Detroit, 
in Detroit neighborhoods. The idea he came up with was put it back in the private sector, all the surplus property, as fast as you can. His first proposal was all the residents who'd stayed, reward them by giving them the surplus property that was near their homes. Ask them, how many lots do you want? It's yours. You just need to man manage it according to ordinances, cut the grass, pick up the garbage, and pay the taxes. So he went to the city and he told the mayor, if you do this overnight, it'll be transformational. People will take a greater stake in Detroit. Your budget problems will be alleviated. They'll be paying taxes. You'll shed the maintenance costs. The neighborhoods will look better. People will be talking more positively about the city. Your image will improve, and it'll be a new day in Detroit. Detroit said, we understand your point, but we are not going to give the land away. So then John thought, well, okay, what if people bought the land? The city wanted cash for its liability of land. What if he bought some land? So John went back to the mayor with a proposal. He would spend up to $30 million to repurpose up to 10,000 acres of blighted surplus property owned by the city of Detroit. Well, it started a dialogue. We didn't get 10,000 acres but it started a dialogue. Not being a farmer himself, John called Michigan State University to ask if there was someone who could develop a business plan that would test the concept of a larger scale farm in the city of Detroit. Well, Michigan State University knew about my background and my expertise, so they asked if I could help John. So I simply shared the business plan that I had developed a few years earlier with John's employees. And it was through this work that John and I met. And I've been working with John Hance and his team for the past six years to launch Hance Farms in Detroit. We currently own nearly 200 acres in the city within a square mile. So we own about one third of the square mile. The other two thirds of the square mile, it's owned by other private property owners. The city, they're like speculators. They're like gambling addicts. They couldn't like go of all of the surplus property. So while in selling us all their surplus property, they labeled some of their surplus property not surplus property so they could hold on to it so that if we were right and we did what we said we'd do, their holdings would increase in value. So now we mow nearly 2,000 formerly neglected lots within a square mile every two weeks during the season. We're ripping out brush that grew up in alleys. You can now see from one street to the other. In fact, you can see three, four streets over where we've done our cleanup work. We're demolishing dangerous structures. By the end of this year, we'll have torn down between 50 and 60 dangerous structures within our square mile. We are making Detroit's landscape more livable. Our concept is clearly doable. It's affordable. It's replicable. And it didn't happen by accident. It happened by design. Thank you.